We're still in the season of Advent. Advent is a season of repentance, sorrow for the sins with which we have committed and confidence or trust in the forgiveness Jesus has won for us. It's a season of sorrow. And yet this morning our focus is on joy. When you know that someone important is about to come, when you know that someone you love dearly is about to arrive, joy fills your heart. And thus in this season of Advent, where our main focus is on repentance, there is also a message of joy. And that's our joy this morning, knowing that our Lord Jesus is coming. We'll celebrate his birth soon, and we look forward to his return to this earth. A good morning and a welcome to all of you. If you're using your hymnal for your order of worship today, we begin on page 15. But before we begin that order of worship, we're going to light the Advent candles. We light three Advent candles, remembering Jesus, the light of the world. He came to defeat the Prince of Darkness. We remember Jesus, who came in answer to his people's prayers. John proclaimed him the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. We hear his call to see the light. We light three Advent candles as a sign of our trust and confidence. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest. Through your word and spirit, may our souls be blessed. We sing hymn number 12, stanzas 1 and 4. and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Hear our prayers, Lord Jesus Christ, and come with the good news of your mighty deliverance. Drive the darkness from our hearts and fill us with your light. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The congregation may be seated. Our first lesson on this third Sunday in Advent 
is from the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, chapter 61. The Lord himself speaks through Isaiah and announces that he will come in order to proclaim the good news of freedom and happiness. Such blessings will then lead us to rejoice in his coming. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. I delight greatly in the Lord, my soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the soil makes the sprout come up, and a garden causes seeds to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. Here ends the first lesson. The psalm of the day is number 71. We'll read it responsively. In you, O Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Rescue me and deliver me in your righteousness. Turn your ear to me and save me. Be my rock of refuge to which I can always go. For you are my rock and my fortress. Since my youth, O God, you have taught me and to this day I declare your marvelous deeds. Even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, O God, till I declare your power to the next generation, your might to all who are to come. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. This morning's second lesson is from Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 5. Paul gives us instructions on how to live as we wait for Jesus to come back to this earth. The motive and the power to live such godly lives comes from God himself, who will keep us in our faith until the Lord Jesus returns. This reading will serve later as our sermon text. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything. Hold on to the good. Avoid every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Here ends the second lesson. Alleluia, I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. Alleluia. Please stand for today's gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, chapter 1. Glory be to you, O Lord. John the Baptist came not as the one who would bring eternal joy to people, but as the one who prepared the way for the one who would, namely Jesus. John never failed to point out the fact that he was not the Savior who had been promised. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. Now this was John's testimony when the Jews of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Christ. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the desert, make straight the way for the Lord. Now some Pharisees who had been sent questioned him, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? 
I baptize with water, John replied. But among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany, on the other side of the Jordan, where John was baptizing. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise be to you, O Christ. We join in confessing the Christian faith using the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated for the hymn of the day. Hymn 14 stands as one and four. <laughs> Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, dear fellow redeemed. We live in a graphic world. And by graphic, I mean that you can see what's going on right there, even though it happened on the other side of the world. Cameras are everywhere, and people are taking pictures of what they are seeing. They're taking videos of the activity in front of them, and they're sharing them with you, or they're posting them so that anyone can see them. We don't have to imagine what other people are seeing. It's right there. We can see how beautiful, amazing, unusual, entertaining, horrific, disturbing, such things are. Today marks the third Sunday in Advent. And every year on this third Sunday in Advent, we receive our Lord's encouragement to rejoice. That joy comes from the fact that our Lord and Savior who came to this earth once as the child of Bethlehem will come back to claim us as his own, as the King of kings and Lord of lords, the judge of all people on the last day. We're filled with joy over that truth. 
But aside from the fact that our worship theme encourages you to rejoice, and from the fact that our hymns, our scripture readings, and our prayers contain the theme of joy, just how joyful are you as you sit there in your pew this morning? If I were to take a picture of you and share it with someone, if I were to take a selfie and share it with someone, would they come to the conclusion that our worship theme this morning is an encouragement for us to rejoice? I doubt it. I don't see a lot of joy on your faces, and you don't see it on mine either. But that's okay. It's okay. Because Christian joy does not make us giddy on the outside. It isn't seen in the way that we jump around for joy as some children do. No, Christian joy is on the inside. It's a smile on the heart, if you will. By God's grace, through faith in Jesus, he has placed that joy in your heart. And even though we can't see that joy, it's evident as we carry out our Christian lives from day to day. And that's the situation that the Apostle Paul addresses here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. He encourages us to live in that joy on a daily basis. But that leads us to ask the question, what do joyful Christians look like? Let's keep that question before us and see how the Lord Jesus answers it in this portion of his word and fills your heart with Christian joy. So, regarding the joy that you're looking for in your life, what are its sources? Where do you look for joy? I advise people not to look for joy in sinful human beings or from something in our sinful world. Oh, joy can be found there, but the problem is it, they are sinful people and this is a sinful world. And by definition, sin brings frustration in our lives. So the joy that we may be finding in other people or in some place of our world or in something of our world is not going to last. It will fade. It will dry up. It'll be gone. So where can you look for joy? Well, in spiritual things. And that's what the Apostle Paul encourages here in the opening words of our text. He says, be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. He says, be joyful always. And then did you notice what he did not say? He didn't say, go out and find that in some relationship with somebody else. Go out and find that in some aspect of our world. Go buy yourself something so that you're filled with happiness or joy. No, instead, he points to a spiritual outlook on your daily life. He says, first of all, pray continually. Now, how in the world can you do that? You've got to live and eat and sleep and work, go to school. You have things that have to be taken care of in life on a daily basis. How can you pray continually? It's not possible. Granted. So what does this mean? One Christian has said that to, to pray continually is the Christian's constant readiness to approach God in prayer in any and every situation of life. Constant readiness. So when you're experiencing a blessing in life, a thank you, Lord, is either uttered by your lips or spoken with your mind and your heart. And when you're facing a tragedy in life, it's, Lord, give me strength, comfort me, and remove this from me, whether it's spoken or not. You see, God's intent with prayer is not that they simply be spoken in this building on one hour every Sunday, or that you speak them before or after your meals. His intent is that you have this readiness to speak to him in prayer. You have a spiritual outlook on life because of the joy that is in your heart. And then Paul goes on to say, give thanks in all circumstances. But how can you give thanks when tragedy strikes? when you're facing one disappointment after another, when life is so frustrating. 
because you know that what you need most of all is yours. As sinful people, what we need more than anything else is the forgiveness of sins in Jesus as one that by his life, death, and resurrection, it's yours. You live in it every day. And eternal life is yours. No matter what's happening in your outward life. Because you know that you have a higher life, a spiritual life, and with it comes a spiritual outlook on your daily life. What, does a jo what do joyful Christians look like? They have a spiritual outlook on daily life. But I have a confession to make. I'm not so good at that. How well are you doing with that? When things start to unravel in my life, when I get bombed by some tragedy, when heartache is my constant companion, I tend to fall apart psychologically and emotionally. My world starts caving in. And it's because I have forgotten that relationship that I have with my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. How about you? You see, the Lord Jesus is still there reminding us that he has suffered and died for every time we've decided to exclude him from our outlook on life. He rose again to assure me of life with him. He has placed his name on me at my baptism. Why? So that he can bless me eternally, no matter what I'm facing right now. And that fills the Christian with joy. What do joyful Christians look like? They have a spiritual outlook on their daily life. I got a question for you little survey. I don't expect you to answer it or even to raise your hand. Are you spending more time or less time listening to, watching, and reading local, state, national, and international news? More or less than you were before? I'm going to go out on a limb here and say you're probably spending less, the majority of you anyway. I know I am. It's because I'm sick and tired of it. I hear the same thing every day. It doesn't get any better. And even when I hear something, I don't know if what I'm hearing is the truth. So I've decided to spend less time, less attention, pay less attention to what that is saying. And that's been a blessing because it's caused me to spend or given me the opportunity to spend more time on what really matters, and that is the truth of our God, His Word. And that's where St. Paul points you and me in our joyful Christian lives next. He says it like this, do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything. Hold on to the good. Avoid every kind of evil. Each of those encouragements has something to do with the Word of God. He's saying pay attention to the Word of God. Don't put out the Spirit's fire. What does he mean? The Holy Spirit wants to work in you every day of your life, and he uses the Word of God to do that. Don't frustrate him. Instead of focusing on the news, what's happening out there, focus on what your God has done for you and promises to do for you. I guarantee you, you'll be filled with joy. And then he says, don't treat prophecies with contempt. What does that mean? Well, by prophecies, he means the Word of God, the truth that God shares with you in His Word. Truth about the past, the present, and the future. He says, don't treat them with contempt. When God guides you with His Word, take it to heart. Honor that Word. Don't say, look, that's not going to work for me in this situation. I think I know better. I better do this rather than what God says because that's what's going to fill me with joy. Don't treat prophecies with contempt. Finally, he says, test everything using the word of God. Hold on to the good and get rid of the bad. Get rid of the evil. I don't have to remind you that our world is swimming in spiritual sewage. It's drowning. It's awful. And we're affected by it. Don't give in. He says, test everything. Use the word of God. Hold on to what is good and get rid of every evil. So what do joyful Christians look like? They pay attention to the word, God's word. I told you that I've had more opportunity to do that now because I pay less attention to the news, but I still struggle with it. I struggle with it every day. How about you? 
And that's because a sinful nature lives inside of me just as one lives inside of you. And my sinful nature wants nothing to do with the Word of God. My sinful nature goes absolutely against, contrary to everything God says. So when God says this is right, my sinful nature says it's wrong. And when God's word says that's wrong, my sinful nature says, no, that's right. And it goes on in me every day. And I lose. How can I win? With Christ. The power of the risen Lord Jesus lives in you. And it began when you were baptized. The risen Christ lives in us and gives us power to live according to that word, to win our daily battles with our sinful nature, to glorify our God, to live in Christian joy. What do joyful Christians look like? They pay attention to the word of God. You know, all day long we're confronted with things we should be doing whether it's from your mobile device or the TV screen in your living room, commercials, ads, whatever it is, you are being encouraged to do something, buy something, change your habits, get out and do this or that. Everybody's telling you to do stuff. And when you get to work or school, it's, it doesn't stop. You're expected to be doing something. And even when you're sitting at home trying to simply relax, in the back of your mind are these things you should be doing, doing, doing. One of the most marvelous truths of Christianity is there's nothing left for you to do. It's all been done by Christ. There is your comfort. And from that fact comes your Christian joy. Paul says it like this. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. First Paul prays for God to sanctify us. My catechism students know that means to make us holy. It means to set us apart. Paul says, Lord, set me apart. Make me holy every day and let it show by the way that I live, by the way that I interact with other people. Help me with your word. Guide me with your word so that I let others see the joy that I have in my Christian faith. And then, God will keep you blameless. In this season of Advent, we focus on the fact that our Lord Jesus will return on the last day and judge all people. And that doesn't exactly make us feel all that comfortable, does it? Here Paul says, look, you're blameless now. God has nothing against you. Your sins are forgiven. Gone. And he will keep you that way until the last day when the Lord Jesus returns. He will keep you in your faith. Preserve you blameless until the Lord Jesus returns. That's what God wants for you. And he will accomplish it because he loves you, because he is gracious. And that fills the Christian's heart with joy. What do joyful Christians look like? They persevere until the Lord's return. I imagine things have been getting busy for you. And as every day passes here in December, they get busier and busier as you get ready for the 24th or the 25th. And that's the way things are every December. Those are important dates. But there is a more important date on your calendar. It's the day of the Lord's return. Unfortunately, it's not marked anywhere. But we live in readiness for that day by faith in Christ as our Savior from sin because you are blameless. And so that means that no matter what's happening around you, you are ready for that greatest day in the, the next greatest day in all of history. Your Lord's return because you're blameless. Let that truth fill your heart with joy and live in that joy. Rejoice, Paul said. Your Lord is coming. May he come soon and fill us with eternal joy. Amen. Please stand.
the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Please be seated for a moment of meditation. As you, Lord, have lived for others, so may we for others live. Freely have your gifts been granted, freely may your servants give. Yours the gold and yours the silver, yours the wealth of land and sea. We but stewards of your bounty, held in solemn trust will be. Amen. Please stand for prayer. O oh Lord God, through all the long years of promise, you led your Old Testament people, nourishing and sustaining them with the hope of deliverance. Grant us also patient faith in your precious promises, that we may rejoice in your salvation and give you thanks. Heavenly Father, we, your children, bring our prayers and petitions with thanksgiving. According to the necessities of each of us, send such deliverance as will renew us in body and spirit. Forgive our sins and blot out all our iniquities. Let your Holy Spirit descend upon us, that our faith may not fail in that day when our Lord will come again to bring to light the hidden things of darkness and make known the thoughts of the heart. Bless all who are gathered here this day in the fellowship of faith. Be with those of our number who are sick or under any affliction of body, mind, or spirit. Comfort them that they may, through their trials, learn of your gracious power and readiness to help in every time of need. Heavenly Father, as we come to the Lord's table to receive the heavenly food of our Savior's body and blood, use it to comfort our hearts and to give peace to our minds. Use it to strengthen and sustain our faith and to purify our love. And as we leave this table, may it be with a renewed zeal to live godly lives to your glory. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, who has also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We continue with the sacrament. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is good and right so to do. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, whose way John the Baptist prepared when he called people to repentance and pointed to Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song.
Lord Jesus Christ on the night he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Amen. follow the direction of the usher and approaching the front of the church to receive the Lord's Supper. Savior Jesus Christ, given into death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. May this strengthen and keep you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given into death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. May this strengthen and keep you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given into death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. 
May this strengthen and keep you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given into death for your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. May this strengthen and keep you in the true faith until life everlasting. Depart in peace. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. Please stand. We join now in singing the Song of Simeon on page 12 of your worship folder. to the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endures forever. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this holy supper. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the closing hymn. We'll sing stanzas one and two. <laughs>
our God's goodness is seen in the fact that he desires to meet with his people through word and sacrament and to bring them comfort and confidence as they live their lives for him. It's my prayer that the joy you've experienced through that word and sacrament this morning go with you in the week ahead as you live to the glory of your Savior, Jesus Christ. Just a couple of announcements. Offering envelope packets for 2021 are on the table in the narthex. If you're watching this video and you're a member of our congregation and you would like me to mail that envelope packet to you, please send me an email or call the church office and put a message on the answering machine and we'll take care of that. Christmas worship invitations have been produced. They're an invitation to not only to be here in person, but also to watch our service live streamed. So if you have someone you know who would really use that, take one of these uh, invitations and mail it out in the days or week ahead. Uh, and pray that God will use that to bring them the comfort and the joy of a Savior born for them as well. Uh, poinsettias are, uh, can be ordered, uh, but the, uh, they will be picked up tomorrow. So if you want a poinsettia, see the sign-up uh, sheet today. If you're watching this video and you'd like to order one, please call me on my cell phone or text me, and I'll get that information to Yvonne Beer, who's taking care of that for us. Uh, the annual meeting will uh, convene shortly after you're dismissed. We ask that you would go out the side aisle, starting from the back and going to the front. If there's ah, one more thing, I noticed uh, that I have a mistake on the church calendar for Sunday the 27th. I have it listed that we have church at 8, 15, and 10 with Bible class at 9. We will not be having Bible class at 9. We'll only, we'll, so we may move that first service to 9 o'clock. I'll speak about that with the elders and let you know. By the way, this week, I intend to send out the sign up for Christmas Eve and Christmas Day worship. It's really important that you let us know how many, if you're coming and how many to expect. I'd rather have you put yourself down and then find out that you can't make it. We need to determine how many people are going to come so that we can do this as safely as possible. There's a chance we might add a service if we need to, but we need people to sign up ahead of time in order to make that decision as wisely as possible. So watch for that coming out in this uh, next couple of days. Those are the announcements. Have a blessed day.